lost my way And out of the darkness I began to pray I said, God What can I do? Then I listened the sun in I hadn't noticed before There's light I see The song I hear A beautiful melody Rhythm and harmony Celebrate life dreams celebrate love it's in between celebrate faith to see you through celebrate me i'll celebrate celebrate you it's all in your heart it's all in your mind Don't give up on hope Just give it more time
musical espresso. Yeah, not just coffee with a bunch of cream. No, musical espresso. It's fun. Thank you. Let's just take a deep breath. Wow. This is the final Sunday of a theme that I've been sharing, which is the never-ending story. And hopefully, if at the end of this, you begin to become aware of the stories you tell yourself or the stories that you let in that influence you, then good. Because we, we are influenced by stories. Joseph Campbell quoted T.R. de Chardin with this statement, which I, I so believe is true. The universe is not made up of atoms, it's made up of stories. And I hope that you started to notice, probably not in yourself, it's harder to notice in yourself. But it's easier to notice the stories people live in, individually and culturally. And I'm, I'm going to address some of that right now. But, uh, you know, like, here's an example of my story. My, my story. Let's just start with my story. My never, one of my never-ending stories until I stopped it. <laughs> Stop. And that never-ending story showed up in my culture, which came from a logging community. And in that community, at the time that I was born and being raised and... and, and culturated, what I don't know, I guess that's the word to use, a woman's worth depended upon the man she was with. Um, we were not expected to make as much, just get over it. How many of you were old enough to see what someone could make if they were a man or a woman? It was always two listings, man or woman. So therefore, you need to find, if you really wanted to have an income that would be that would be substantial, you had to marry somebody with a substantial income. So I, I really bought into that. I bought into it so much that my, my, not only my life, but my eternal life was dependent upon the man that I would marry, that I converted to Mormonism. Uh, yeah. I was kind of like... Jerry, uh, I had had an epiphany also and realized that the God of love wouldn't send anybody to hell. So I remember asking the God of love, so show me another way to, to worship. And I met a missionary. <laughs> and he was really cute. Anyway, didn't, didn't marry him, but I, was, I, I converted. And, and what I did was, uh, well, I have to tell you why I did it. The Mormon church doesn't have hell, but they have levels of heaven. And the woman can only go to the level of heaven that her husband goes to. So I started looking for a bishop. Because <laughs> I already had a relationship with God, and I wanted a closer relationship with God. And if I had to get it through you, you would be a bishop. So I married my first husband not based on interests. So we didn't have the same interests, but he was bishop material. Didn't last long. It's, I now know that that's not a reason to marry somebody. And someday I'll write a book. The many wives I've been. <laughs> <laughs> But to see, I was living out of, I mean, how, how, how literal did my subjective mind believe that I can only go as far as my husband? I lived that story until I didn't. See, you can't drop a story until you know the story. And when you know the story, you can drop the story and rewrite the story and pick another story. That's why people should tell their stories. You go, I like that story. Oh, that's a good story. You can make it your story. And the story starts to shape the way you look at things, and so it does shape your universe, your universe, your, the way that you show up and how you respond to things. <laughs> culturally, culturally, collectively, we are shaped by creation stories. We are shaped by creation stories. Jerry's experience of Christianity was shaped by the second creation story. I want to share with you another story, and maybe you can pick that story. What, you know, like, why not just pick a story? <laughs> 
So this story says that I have lost my iPhone. That's not true. Okay. This story comes from uh, an indigenous nation. I'm going to call it nation. You know, people call them tribes. They're not tribes. Most of them were not tribes. They were nations. The Cherokee Nation covered what would now be five states. The nations of the indigenous people around the, the Great Lakes area was huge. So this comes from one of the nations in the Great Lakes area. And it's called uh, Sky Woman. She fell like a maple seed, pillowetting in the autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in Sky World, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear or maybe hope, she clutched to a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurling downward, she saw only dark water below. But in that emptiness, there were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a mere dust mote in the, in the beam. As it grew, though, they saw that it was a woman, arms outstretched, long hair billowing behind the spiral body that came towards them. The geese nodded all at one another and rose together from the water to, in a wave of, I love it, goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath her to break her fall. Far, far from the only home she'd ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of the soft feathers as they gently carried her downward, and so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for very long. So they called a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather, the loons, the otters, the swans, the beavers, the fish of all kinds. And a great turtle floated to the surface and offered up its back for her to rest on. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of his shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her in that need. The deep drivers among them had heard a story of mud that existed at the bottom of the water and agreed to go find it for her. Loon do dove first, but the distance was too far, and after a long while, he surfaced with nothing to show for his offerings. One by one, the other animals offered their help, the otter, the beaver, the sturgeon, but the depth, the darkness, and the pressures were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned, gasping for air with their heads ringing. Some of them did not return at all. Soon, only the little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go where the others had been, and they all looked doubtfully at him. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward, and he was gone for a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative. And before long, a stream of bubbles, bubbles rose to the surface, and then a small limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid the helpless human. But when the others noticed what was in his paw, they rejoiced. Turtle said, when they opened up his small paw and had a little bit of mud in it, the turtle said, here, put it on my back, and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent down and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animal, she sang in thanksgiving and then began to dance, and her feet caressed the earth that was spreading across the back of the turtle. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks, and it all came from that little dab of mud on the turtle's back until the whole earth was made. Not by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all the animals' gifts coupled with her gratitude. Together, they formed what we now know as Turtle Island, Earth, our home. Like many good guests, Sky Woman did not come empty-handed. The bundle that she had been clutching in her hand was filled with, ah, seeds and plants. When she toppled from the hole in the sky world, she had reached out and grabbed onto the tree of life that grew there. I love that. The tree of life is in heaven. In the Kabbalah, the tree of life is in heaven and comes to earth. 
in this story, the tree of life is in heaven and comes to earth. She had grabbed its branches, its fruits, its seeds, and all of all kinds of plants. And then she scattered this new, th scattered these seeds and these and these offerings on the new ground, and carefully tended each one until the world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed through the hole from the sky world, allowing the seeds to flourish. Wild grasses, flowers, trees, and medicines spread everywhere. And now the animals, too, could come upon the earth, for there was food for them. Isn't that interesting? Because according to evolution, the life was in the sea first, and then it went into the land. I love these stories, how they're all sort of connected. Oh. So let's take that story in for just a second. You don't have to believe it. Actually, it's been said that the purpose of telling this story is not so that you hear the story as, as fact. It's a folklore. But still, in telling it, there's power in telling it. See, we've been told other stories. Think about it. Think about another story. So this is a story where Sky Woman, who has is, who is come from the heavens, creates a garden on earth, and earth became paradise. There's another story that says that there was a woman placed in a garden with a tree. But because she ate of the fruit, she and her kind were banished from the garden and the gates to paradise were closed. She would only eat if she subdued the wilderness. Earth was something to endure before people could go back to paradise. So one story, earth is paradise. The other story, it's some place to endure, get over, make the best you can, and then go to heaven. Robin Wall Kilmer is a Native American from the tribes in, well, I'm sorry, nations, indigenous nations around the Great Lakes area. And she's also a biologist. <laughs> And she wrote this book, and I'm, I'm going to read it slowly. It's changing me at depth, and I will read it a chapter at a time and just try to work that chapter at a time. It's called Braiding Sweetgrass. It is indigenous wisdom, scientific wisdom, and the teaching of plants. <laughs> I love it. So, so native wisdom, indigenous wisdom, and scientific wisdom. Put together, this sounds a lot like Ernest Holmes when he said, we take the findings of science, the opinions of philosophy, and the discoveries of, of, of religions, and we put them together. And so she takes two, that seems like it's two ways of looking at things, scientifically and spiritually, that seem like they're at odds, and she puts them together. And it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, and... Uh, and it's important that we, that we look at our stories and what they do to us. Because stories are a way of instructing our soul. Actually, stories are a reminder to remember something that's been in us for a long time. Now let's look at two stories. In the Western tradition, in the Western tradition, we see creation as a hierarchy with humankind at the top, plants at the bottom, and then smaller animals, and then bigger animals, and then bigger animals, and then us. In more native or indigenous cultures, <laughs> especially if you're a native, native North American, uh, what they say is that humans are just part of this whole cycle, but, uh, this is, I love it, this is a quote, humans are referred to as the younger siblings of the rest of creation. The younger siblings of the rest of creation. Because we have experienced the least amount of life on earth, therefore we should learn and not subdue the rest of creation. Learn from creation, don't subdue it. 
Now, this really resonates with me. This resonates with me for a lot of reasons. First, I love science. I love seeing how a cell works. And if I could just be a healthy cell and I could surround myself with healthy cells, then the organization would be healthy. And, you know, uh, cancer is just a cell gone rogue. I mean, it's just, I, just, I love that kind of science. I really love this wisdom of plants that's just been coming out, I'd say, in the last two decades. I've talked about this before, but plants, it's been proven they talk to each other, they support each other. There's usually a mother tree in a forest, and she, she will say, you know, you're taking too much nutrients, you got to let the little ones grow. I mean, honestly, there's a whole communication going on below the ground. They're smart. They're, they're alive. I do retreats sometimes where I send people out to go pick a tree and listen to the tree. And usually they go out like, meh, and they come back like, whoa. <laughs> we used to do... Um, coming of age programs and we will again when we get more more young people in 11 to 13 year old uh, time frame and we would uh, not we the the program would take them to a place with a lot of trees they were blindfolded they didn't get to see the tree they were going to they'd spend about three hours with the tree talk to the tree get enlightenment have answers support they'd take them back Un unblindfold them, they'd have lunch, then they'd take them back to that same forest or forested area, and they'd say, now go pick out your tree. And they could. Because <laughs> everything's alive. Everything's holy now. Everything's holy now. All of creation is holy now. All creation is alive now. Everything is, is the love vibration, the intelligent vibration of a life form that is bigger than us or the earth or anything else. Mm. Also, I have to give credit to my grandfather. My grandfather was my first ecology teacher. He had uh, left... Um, Oklahoma after the, well, during the Dust Bowl. And he'd seen what clear cutting did. So when he bought land, he used to start with just a little bit of land and then more land and then more land. He would log it, but he used horse logging because the horse could go in and he could cut down a tree and not have to cut down a, a road for a truck. He wouldn't have to clear for, for where they're going to set up the logs. He could go in, take out a tree, and he said, by next year, you won't even see this. And, and therefore, the younger trees could still grow up. It was, a, it was a, re, a renewable space. It did less damage that way. He had a, I remember being young and him living on this place that he was logging, uh, but there were big fields, and bears would run across, and he'd say, you know, a bear lives up that gully. Don't ride up that gully. Because the bear might scare the horse, and if you get hurt, I'm going to have to do something about the bear. I don't want to do anything about the bear. I want you to stay away from the bear. When the cougars started taking out his uh, flock of sheep, he just got rid of the sheep. He said, the cougar and the bear were here before well, I was. This is their land. Do you see that that's a more sustainable story? A story of inclusion? We say in this philosophy that there's one life. Well, then all life is that one life. All life is that one life. So how many of you feel called to shift your collective story? A few of you. Thank you. Well, I'll help you out just for something to stand on as a foundation. <laughs> One story in the Bible says that, that people were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and they had to, you know, to the uh, wilderness and that... And that was their punishment. They, they, it's like, think about it. The story is the earth is the punishment for Adam and Eve. That doesn't make it very holy. It makes it a jail. But they didn't read Psalm 19. Oh. 24, thank you. It's like, that, that wasn't what I read. Hmm. The earth belongs to the Lord and everything on it is his. For he founded it in the empty space and breathed his own life breath into it. 
filling it with the manifold creatures, each one precious in his sight. Ernest Holmes said that creation is the manifestation of spirit. It's spirit slowed down enough that we can perceive it. All one, vibrating at a place that we can interact with it. If you take science, <laughs> we're basically empty space here. We, it's just all of the same thing, the science and the philosophy, Ernest Holmes, the religious point of view, and now let's get an indigenous person that we may all remember or think of, and that's Chief Seattle. Will you teach your children what we have been teaching our children, that the earth is our mother? What befalls the earth befalls all the sons of the earth. This we know. The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites all humankind. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whew, well, that'll bring you back into, like, <laughs> reality, won't it? Get over us being a big deal. <laughs> Everything is holy now. Everything is holy now. It hurts us to have the story of separation. It hurts us that we're somehow flawed because of something that our ancestors, I mean, not even ancestors, I mean, beyond ancestors did. That hurts us. I mean, that's weird. I mean, that's like saying, you know, Uncle John did this, so I'm going to punish you. I mean, no, no one would do that to their children, and God, which is love, wouldn't do it to humankind. It was a story that's a flawed story. It's not, by the way, the first creation story in the Bible where God just went, I created this, and I created this, and I created this, and it's good, and it's good, and it's good, and it's good. Oh, I'm going to take a nap. It's just all so good. <laughs> but people chose the other story. When we choose the story of, of humankind being punished, then that means that there's a punisher, and that means that we have to look out for what we've done or what they're doing, which creates a sense of duality and separation, and separation, and that sense of duality is the root of all evil. It's not money. Money's just currency. But boy, that thought that I have to take from you or you'll take from me or I've got to get it and I've got to hoard it and I've got to keep it and I've got to get what I can and it doesn't matter because as long as I'm going to heaven, who cares what I do on earth? That hurts us. It hurts us individually. It hurts us as a society. That us and them thinking justifies all acts of atrocity. It justifies racism, prejudices, gender inequality. War and genocide. Because it's them. We don't do it to our own. If we saw all as our own, we would act differently. It would be our story. We'd act out of that story. So how do we start to make the shift individually? Individually, we start by meditating. But not meditating like... You know, how, you know, that kind of inward meditation, uh, getting close, you know, our body, our breath, our thoughts, our mantra, our... Anyway, it's good. If you're upset and you need to be centered, that's a good thing. But it's not the same as, this is called, uh, this is called a focused uh, a kind of focused meditation, which a lot of people do in practice. There's also broad meditation, where you not, where you don't just stop with your experience, but you expand your experience, and you can because consciousness is infinite. You can take your your experience outside your body, and then you can take your experience and your consciousness. You can fill the room. You can be in the room. I've done that many times. Just be in the room. You take everything in. And then if you want to and you keep, continue to breathe and you continue to expand, expand out, you can take in the city. It's not like you see everything in the city, but you feel the city. You can start to feel the earth. You can feel your neighborhood. You can feel your yard. Do you see how this is much more inclusive and, ex, and, and embracing than... Mm, it's not that mm, is bad. <laughs> But there is a w another way to meditate. 
It's an expansion of consciousness, therefore it will expand your awareness of other life. We can pray. Infinite intelligence, direct me, guide me. How can I start to change the story for myself and for others? How can I start to be a part of the shift of more earth-based intelligence? How can I honor Mother Earth, Pachamama, Turtle Island? How can I honor it? Just pray to ask and be directed and then follow through. Let's get back to honoring the earth. So we can meditate, we can pray, we can honor, we can honor the earth. Um, I, um, I was really... Um, became aware of that when my first trip to Peru when I learned about just people believing that the earth could give them anything that they wanted. And they lived what we would call a simple life, but they're just so content. And there was something that was practiced by the Andean, by the Andean um, shaman, the Andean culture in Peru. See, there's the Amazon and the Andes. And the Andean culture, they would practice inti, which is I give and then you'll give. So I give to the earth and the earth will give to me. So before a request for something, they would give an offering to 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 Pachamama, they would bless Pachamama. Pachamama didn't, didn't really probably care for what they were giving Pachamama in these little offerings. They would offer things that, that they felt were valuable, like little pieces of gum and hard candy, because they were hard to come by. So they would offer them. And it wasn't the, the thing that they were going to put into this offering. It was the intention to say thank you. That, that made the difference. Thank you. And then, after they did that, we would ask for our own blessings. So we would give, and then we would ask, so that there was always a reciprocal nature of the honoring of Pachamama. Like, and you think about it, we're not alive if she's not alive. We're not alive if she's not alive. Which gets me back to one of the things I was saying first service, and I realized I it was like a, a thought, and I I was directed to um, help my husband not mow the dandelions because dandelions are the first things that the bees are attracted to because they're the first things that come up when they start to come back into life for spring, and we've got plenty of clover, and they're very happy with the clover, but but Tim's like they was show dandelions, like no leave them, leave them. It's one step. Just be directed on your one step. I'm not saying don't, we can't become the dandelion living cult, you know, like, yeah, they honor dandelions. Ooh, weird. No, it's just what we're doing on our little space. <laughs> you'll be directed about what's yours to do. So if you ask, you'll be directed. And then you just honor the earth in some way, shape, or form. Uh, some of the practitioners, the prayer practitioners in this room, remember when we've had um, water offerings uh, to Pachamama because it was summertime and we couldn't do a fire, so we didn't do those kind of uh, offerings, but we did water. And, and people would bring their favorite drink. Now, some people would, you know, slip a little whiskey in. I, I saw some beer. I brought Diet Coke. And, and the reason that we brought what we loved is because it was saying, I love you. I want to give you my best. And it didn't take much. It's the Thanksgiving that makes the difference. <sighs> Gratitude makes the difference. What if all the universe is fed from our gratitude? You know, it, it said that the angels are always in praise and thanksgiving. Well, that always looks like that's what they do. Well, what if we did? What if we lived in this sense of thanksgiving, but we give thanks not only to, the, to what we call our, our universal God or whatever you want to call it, but we're also, we also thankful for the manifestations of God, which is the earth and all of its creation. So we honor the earth. 
And then we start, start to see ourselves as stewards. So if you have land, it's not your land. You get to pay the taxes on that land. But, you, but this is, to quote a country and western song, this is God's country. <laughs> this is God's yard. I don't like that song much at all, but I do like the title. Um, to just start to see ourselves as, as uh, caretakers of a beautiful paradise, wanting to reestablish itself. Then, make incremental shifts. I don't see her in the room right now, but Marilyn Gregory was here for a service, and she might be out there with Gourmets for God. But Marilyn Gregory it, it puts out wonderful, easy things for us to do on the uh, uh, Facebook member page. Little teeny incremental shifts. And she's been putting these out and nudging me for so many years. And, and I, I can make a shift, and 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 pretty soon I'm making more shifts and more shifts. And then I'm asking what's mine to do, and I'm shifting, I'm, I eat differently. And it's like between her and God, I'm a changed girl. It's not like she isn't God's voice, but I mean, some of it's a download and some of it's her n nudge. <laughs> but if we could all make incremental, in, in, incremental changes, and if we all made incremental changes and then we got our friends to do those, we'd start to make some shifts. We, we would be different. And some of you, as some of you will be called to vote differently. We don't tell people what to do. But if the story is that the earth is alive and we're here to support it, that story will start to shift the way people act and choose. It's just the way it is. So we're going to say a prayer, and um, we were going to do a blessing, but <laughs> the dog park that used to be a playground <laughs> has been kind of destroyed in the winter because of lots of overuse. So we're closing it off so that the ground can be revitalized again. So we're not going to go out there. So I encourage you to find a space this afternoon to do this, to put your hands on the earth. You can either sit on the earth or bow to the earth, but put your hands on the earth and just say thank you. Just say thank you, thank you, thank you. Now that's the first part of the process. We, we give first. And then, if you choose, roll over on your back and let the earth bless you in return. Ask for something and let it bless you. I've had, I've had people, their back feels better afterwards. I had a, a, a hip that was kind of kinked. You know, have you ever heard of a catch in your get along? I guess that's what my granny would call it, but <laughs> it got better. So bless, then receive. Give it a try in your own space. And if you don't have a, a yard, there's always a park. <laughs> It'll be kind of funny. I can't wait to see people watching that. Hello. Anyway. <laughs> oh, so let's just come together in consciousness and go back to that idea from Marcia Sutton. Beauty is love made visible. Perhaps the earth loves us so much. It continues to sprout out its beauty whenever it can and wherever it can. And not only does it show up in the form of plants, it shows up in the form of our friends and our family and our pets and the birds over, overhead. It shows up in memories. It shows up in the mountains, in the wonderful water. We are so blessed to be in this place. And so, with heart filled with gratitude, let us just simply together know that we are here to bless the earth for all that it gives us. Just as we would bless a friend for all the friend gives to us. Just as we would bless our ancestors for all that have come down to us. And from this consciousness, we move out as blessings in form. And so it is.